The topic what I'm, that I will address today is legal landscape in biodiversity and social safeguards. This presentation is based in a discussion paper. Uh, it's a co-author publication between myself, Maria Schultz, Thomas Hahn, and Sarah Cornell, which we prepared for the conference of the parties to the Convention of Biological Diversity that just uh, finished uh, now in India, where people from governments and also other stakeholders uh, meet biannually to make key decisions on biodiversity. But as we will see, there are strong linkages with the climate issues and therefore carbon. This is still open for discussion, so we are really willing to hear your opinion, and this uh, is going to become more scientific article, so all your contributions are very welcome. The presentation structure, I'm going to start with an introduction. Then I will address the legal landscape approach. Then specific legal landscapes on safeguards. And then safeguards and different types of biodiversity financing mechanisms. And end up with some concluding remarks. When you breathe, uh, there is something I forgot to say. Uh, it might last July below on contribution here. Yeah, but since you're born, you're not okay. Uh, okay. Uh, it's it just to say that when there's three minutes left, I'll wave with this one. And when this, your time is out, you're taking someone else's time, I'll wave with that one. So that's okay. So you have that information beforehand. Good, thanks. Very brutal. <laughs> okay, so when we're talking about safeguards, what are we talking about? Well, this notion, it's an evolving notion. It started with financial institutions specifically the World Bank using it in the 1990s as a reaction from high profile controversies, including, for example, resettlements of people. So this notion had more of a defensive approach and it evolved into something different and it has gained momentum, especially within the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, where a set of safeguards were actually adopted, which are quite broad. They include from issues of governance to participation, explicit reference to the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. So here, what, when I'm referring to safeguards, is to refer to these measures that are in place to protect people's livelihoods and biodiversity, and to decrease, try to minimize, the negative impact, and this includes uh, c from initiatives or programs related to climate. When we talk about biodiversity financing mechanisms, there was a decision at the international level that started talking about innovative mechanisms, innovative financial mechanisms, but it happened to be that it included non-market and market alternative established and new mechanisms. So that's why we are using biodiversity financing mechanisms. And here they are included, for example, action for reducing emissions from deforestation and forest degradation and enhancing carbon stocks. So we see the explicit link with carbon issues. Well, why do we protect biodiversity? Well, for their diverse values, both both tangible and intangible, tradable and not tradable. But how do we do that? It's still very much under discussion. So when we talk about financial mechanisms, it doesn't mean necessarily letting the market solve everything. I think sometimes there is a misconception about that. Here, we're not talking about that. It is both kind of mechanisms what are under discussion under uh, this framework, specifically under the Convention of Biological Diversity. A legal landscape approach, and generally we hear about the landscape approach, I'd like to link it with the legal issues, and it'll be very interesting also, as you will see, my last question will deal with that, and your contribution will be very valuable. It's an emphasis on dynamic legal systems concerning both the interaction between people and nature, also trying to reconcile the trade stuff 
between conserving biodiversity and fulfilling the needs of people and having a positive impact in their livelihoods. It implies social learning, including approaches to change and to sudden changes, and these for better governance. Then while being context specific, it allows us to look at different scales and takes into account not only forests, that it's what it has been more emphasized within uh, reducing emissions from uh, deforestation and forest degradation and enhancing carbon stocks. I will refer to red plus, not to be repeating it the whole time. So then when we're talking about the different legal landscapes and safeguards, I'm bringing up uh, this new topic of uh, biodiversity financing mechanisms, but it's important to see what is already out there. We don't need to reinvent the wheel. And these biodiversity financing mechanisms are seen by some as problem solvers, but they are seen by others as sources of problems. So there are a bit polarized view on this. And actually looking at what is already there, what already consensus out there can help us reach more agreements. And here, if we think in legal terms, it's good to have this distinction between procedural and substantive safeguards. Substantive safeguards are those provisions in legal instruments that define which are the rights and duties at stake and include, for example, tenure and property rights issues. Procedural safeguards are actually those processes, those measures that you actually need to have in place to make effective those rights and those duties. Both are necessary, but it's good to distinguish them to see which are the points we are addressing. Thinking of safeguards at multiple scales and their dynamic interaction. Well, I already mentioned the safeguards regarding the UNFCCC, the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. But safeguards now are being discussed beyond these official legal processes. For example, there is this private scheme for community, climate and biodiversity standards there are certified projects that have a land use element that aim to mitigate climate change, but at the same time have biodiversity and social benefits. We also see that there are different notions that are being discussed at the international level, such as in the Nagoya Protocol for access and benefit sharing, derived from genetic resources. There they talk about biocultural community protocols. Think of this notion as actually very useful also for the climate negotiations, both at the international and local level. What are they? Well, they are agreed at the very local level between communities. There are statements of self-determination where people sit and discuss between themselves what are the priorities in the long term for them. You have projects, they're relatively short term if you think about the livelihoods of a community. So what do you want as a long term? And then you get projects that can help you reach your goals. And this can be actually a way also to determine which are your conditions or the way you want to relate with outsiders. And here it's where the national and local articulation takes place. You have social environmental impact assessments. You have them at different levels as well. It, they're already there. What can they serve us for? Well, they can serve us to determine what needs safeguarding in particular contexts. So now that we have touched upon certain elements that are out there, in, in this discussion paper, we develop for the principles that can save us to have like a shared language where we can build on into more consensus. A key one, if we're thinking again in red projects, 
that have this climate and carbon element, you also need to think at the same time what are the repercussions that that will have in biodiversity and people's livelihoods. So here the biodiversity values for local livelihoods are important throughout the process of the programs and projects from the design to the implementation. Another key principle has to do with people's rights, access to resources and livelihoods. And here it's about the equitable allocation of these rights and duties that we were talking about. And here the notion of free prior informed consent of local communities and indigenous people that might be affected by projects. It's uh, something that has already been recognized in several international and national law. Local and country specific processes, they are linked to international level, as I was mentioning before with the biocultural community protocols. And then we have key issues. And that's why we put out this principle of governance, institutional frameworks and accountability. You can have excellent safeguards, biodiversity, social safeguards. But if you don't have the mechanisms that people actually make that safeguards happen in reality, they are really not having an impact. So these can be seen as prerequisites for safeguards to function. And then how do we apply these general principles and elements to specific mechanisms? Here I will mention some of them. There are more in this decision that I was telling you about. Payment for ecosystem services. Certain dimensions of red plus can be seen as a payment for ecosystem service. And here we have procedural safeguards, uh, as I was saying, this participation, this free prior informed consent of the people that are actually being the landowners. But these need to be synchronized with substantive safeguards. What is this? Well, you have that in many countries, say Mexico, Peru, the person that actually is having the property rights over the land may be different to the person that is having the property rights over the forest. And, this, and the person having the property or the community having the property rights over the carbon can be a completely different one. So, People may be engaging into an agreement with a, a project proponent, but if they don't have the rights to do so, legally speaking, this can be the source of problems afterwards. And to try to prevent that, we really need to bring these substantive and procedural safeguards together. And as I said, uh, tangible resources, we can think about land, forest, but they have also need to be linked with intangible resources which can be carbon, but also rights over knowledge. And this is not only modern knowledge, it's also about traditional knowledge of people that are in constant relationship with nature and they have a very important expertise. We have fiscal reforms. And here we're talking about safeguards to reduce the perverse incentives, such as avoiding subsidies to unsustainable practices. So here we see that in some payment for ecosystem services, the emphasis has been, not in all, but in some, on regulating with strict conservation measures communities. What the proposal is here is focus on the drivers, illegal logging, for example. That's, you can have a much better impact in protecting biodiversity in achieving your climate-related goals. And we can see that payment for ecosystem services may be sometimes financed with an earmark fiscal reform. And just to give you an example, there is this program in Ecuador that deals with the protection of uh, forestry and at the same time aims to mitigate climate change and have social and biodiversity benefits. How do they get the money from that? Well, they use uh, tax on fossil fuels and other types of taxes 
to actually finance this initiative. International development assistance. Although this net may not be the so-called that I was mentioning innovative financing mechanisms, it can provide seed money, and we have seen some examples. For example, there is this scheme called Plan Bibo that tends to certify projects that fulfill climate, biodiversity, and social requirements, and they have been funded initially by international development assistance. And there are also important lessons in terms of, for example, mainstreaming gender, in terms of participation, in terms of equitable distribution of resources that we can learn from that. So concluding remarks. So I just mentioned as an example, payment for existing services and RED and fiscal reforms. We see that each of them need to respond to the risk and opportunities of the nature of the mechanism. However, there are linkages in practice between the different biodiversity financing mechanisms. So if we harmonize the safeguards, biodiversity and social safeguards, in climate-related projects, we can be achieving more effectively and more equitable our goals. And the guiding principles I mentioned, they can be actually the underlying baseline that can apply to all the safeguards and to all the biodiversity financing mechanisms examined in the presentation. And the legal landscape approach. Well, it can serve us for developing and implementing safeguards with a new perspective. And coming back to this extension that I was talking about, substantive safeguards, it can make us look with a broader perspective in defining those rights and duties and reconciling biodiversity, conservation with all ecosystems. As I was saying before, now the emphasis has been enforced since there are carbon-related benefits there, but there are savannas, there are wetlands, and actually what we do in one ecosystem affects the others. And people livelihoods, I mean, people live in more places than for us. So if we address these two issues, we're actually having a broader strategy and a more effective one. And then procedural safeguards. Well, it involves a shift of perspective. When we think about law, sometimes we think about this static, very rigid provisions on laws. Here we're thinking about something more dynamic, that it's locally rooted, that it's supported by national frameworks, and also taking stock of international legal and policy instruments. And I would just like to end saying that safeguards can actually be a means of linking climate objectives, biodiversity, and social issues. And my question then to you, my two questions are whether you think that a landscape approach can help us link law, which has this very emphasis, uncertainty, with this more flexible and adaptive no notion that is resilience. And my second question is whether you think... Uh, sorry, sorry, I'm probably the only one not getting it. Can you just repeat the question once more? Okay, so do you think that a landscape approach can help us bring together law which is generally linked to this certainty and more static in some ways with this notion of resilience that is more linked to this flexible and adaptive approach. And my second question is whether you think a landscape approach can help us to articulate different scales to achieve 
equitable governance and the sustainable use of biodiversity in climate related initiatives. So thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, Claudia, very much for uh, your presentation and your insight. Mike, 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 Mike. sorry. <laughs> I'm going to remind you all the time. I'm very happy for that. Thank you, Claudia. And uh, now, since you don't have that much time, I'll, I'll not speak for myself. Uh, please, so Claudia, can you stand up here as well and be, be available for questions? So the floor is yours. Yes, brilliant, I think. Yeah. Do I need a mic as well? Screen. Yeah. It's not that I want to hear it. Okay, here, here's a mic. Okay, thank you very much, Claudia. This is a new area to me, so I, I didn't get all of what you were saying. Um, but I have a, I have a, a question then to you that maybe you could clarify for me. Because in, in these contexts, if I'm thinking developing countries, many cases, uh, livelihoods and the resources are guarded by more collective traditional rights. And also maybe not that formalized and, and maybe also access rights rather than um, than legal tenure. So would this approach, does it does this mean that we need, could this work for that type of rights or is this, you know, something that would just drive for private individual tenure? Mm -hmm. okay. uh, Helene, could you pass it to Anna? So we'll take a couple of questions at a time. Um, yeah, no, I think um, the landscape approach is very interesting. And uh, now we have also the European Landscape Convention uh, that is supporting this approach uh, through development of landscape le level action plans to conserve landscapes that can then be sort of um, translated into legislation at landscape and local level. However, the multilateral environmental agreements that you refer to, the CBD, the UNFCCC, etc., do, they don't have provisions really for a landscape approach, although they talk a lot about it, because they focus on development of national biodiversity action plans and strategies, national climate change, whatever plans. So my, although this approach, I think, is, is very interesting and uh, it's easier to address interactions between people uh, and environment at the landscape level. I mean, how do you see that this approach could be taken up by these conventions and the red mechanism because of their focus at national level? Thank you. Okay, go ahead, Claudia. Okay. So I think the topic you bring up is extremely important and actually that was one of the I key issues uh, discussed. Uh, previous to this uh, discussion paper they, there was uh, another event called Scaling Up Biodiversity Financing and that was one of the issues that was uh, raised up. And that's the thing, when we talk about national, local and international and that was also the last question. How do we integrate all of them? And that's why I was talking about the biocultural community protocols. Because you're right, I, I, and even more in some countries than in others, for example, African countries or, or some Latin American uh, countries, it is a lot about not definite property rights right, that you have a title for, but more customary or a right that you have use this territory, say, for even uh, religious activities for indigenous people and so on. And that doesn't mean that that's only the group that is using that land. Other groups may be using also that land. So I think that's what needs to be further discussed. And that's why these biocultural community protocols can serve for that, because it is taking into account these tenure rights that are not only those with title, but also customary use, that many legislations actually recognize that if you have had a historical use over land or resources, you actually are entitled to some rights. But how we link that to national legal frameworks that are more 
specific, no? and with this international level. In terms of the European landscape action and how do we, I mean, how do we approach actually this landscape approach to, to the conventions I just mentioned, the Convention of Biological Diversity and the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. I do think that much more needs to be done in those two conventions, specifically when we're talking about reducing emissions from deforestation, forest degradation and enhancing carbon stocks. However, we have uh, just in this last conference of the parties, there was some information document on how red issues <coughs> need to consider biodiversity uh, considerations. And there was a specific, uh, well, it was uh, developed also in collaboration with the uh, CIFOR, and it was applying this landscape perspective to biodiversity issues. So there's, an, an, yeah, some of the legal landscape approach that I mentioned, they mentioned it as landscape approach, but it's, I think, applicable to what I was saying, legal instruments as well. Okay, thank you. There's little time, I'm afraid. And uh, the challenges raised by the systems created already, and when we see that they are a bit dysfunctional, it's, it's a big job to try to, to uh, reform them. But I think that you point to uh, an important, both these private, uh, the customary rights and the, and the property right issues, and also how we reform these big systems that, that somehow are not functional for, for a landscape approach or for a more holistic way of doing things.